All right. Hello and welcome to the coming changes to the tax code, what they mean for you and your farm. We are going to go ahead and kick things off a few moments early here. My name is Claire Weinzerl and I'm the communications manager at the Illinois Soybean Association. Today's webinar will look at the status of negotiations on Capitol Hill surrounding proposed changes to the tax code and will detail the tax changes proposed by the Biden administration and the Democrats in the House of Representatives. You'll hear practical advice on actions farmers should take to be prepared for those changes that are likely to become law later this year. If you have questions during the webinar, please feel free to type them into the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom window, and we will answer those following the presentation. Another note that today's webinar will be recorded in the event that you would like to rewatch or share with your network. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce today's speakers, Brian Keel and Beth Swanson. Brian is Keiko Isom's Director of Government and Public Affairs. He helps Keiko clients track policy developments in Washington, D.C., and advocates on behalf of U.S. agriculture. Brian also serves as Executive Director for two agriculture trade associations, Farmers for Free Trade and the Agriculture Trade Education Council. Beth Swanson is a manager in Keiko Isom's Kansas City office. She works with Keiko's National Tax Solutions team, providing creative tax planning strategies to family businesses and farm operations. Beth specializes in federal tax issues relating to business transitions and estate planning, as well as federal tax legislation analysis. Please join me in welcoming Brian and Beth. Thank you so much, and uh, and thank you to Illinois Soybean Association. Um, I know we've we've kicked this uh, webinar off a couple minutes early, so if you're just dialing in, uh, you're not late. Uh, we just uh, started a couple minutes early, but that's okay. Uh, we'll have a lot of information. I think anyone who's dialing in right on on the buzzer will will still get a full dose of information. Um, uh, as, as indicated, my name is Brian Keel. I'm Director of Government and Public Affairs for Keiko Isom. Uh, hopefully you're all familiar with Keiko Isom at this point. Uh, if you're not, uh, Keiko Isom is a national uh, tax and business advisory firm that works uh, with U.S. agriculture. Uh, we started 83 years ago in Kansas, and since that time have grown, and now pretty much anywhere there's agriculture, there's Keiko Isom. And we do a, a whole range of services for, uh, for farmers, ranchers, and uh, food and ag businesses. Uh, our services include um, obviously tax and audit. Um, uh, we're probably the leading firm in the country on those fronts. Uh, but we also do a whole series of business advisory services, everything from estate and succession planning uh, to helping uh, look at uh, commodity hedging to uh, to uh, looking at sustainability and uh, environmental performance. And, and then, uh, then I focus specifically on government and public affairs. And what that means is that uh, I help the firm uh, track what's happening in Washington, DC, uh, both on the Hill and also in federal agencies. Um, and then I also help organize and coordinate uh, national campaigns in partnership with ag associations uh, to try to move the needle on these critical issues. And I will just give a shout out to Illinois Soybean, uh, really a fantastic state association that does great work, uh, both for advocacy at the state and federal level. Uh, we've really appreciated the partnership with Illinois Soybean and uh, are happy to be here today uh, for this webinar. Uh, today's webinar, uh, as hopefully you know if you're dialing into it, is to focus on the, uh, uh, the tax code machinations on Capitol Hill. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the process of, uh, of Washington, D.C., what's happening, what we think is going to happen. And then we're going to talk um, about the substance, uh, what we think is uh, likely to be in the final bill, what we've already seen, uh, both from the House uh, Ways and Means Committee and also from, uh, uh, from uh, the Senate Finance Committee. Um, so you'll get a, a good dose of information. Uh, I'll cover the process and, uh, and the update as to where we are in Capitol Hill. And then we'll turn to Beth uh, Swanson, who is a tax attorney with Keiko Isom, who will walk you through the main provisions that we're tracking and hopefully give you some practical information and advice about, about things you may want to do to, uh, to prepare for these coming tax code changes. Uh, we will put aside hopefully 15, 20 minutes for Q&A at the end of the webinar. And if you have questions that we don't get to uh, during the webinar, you can certainly uh, you can certainly come back to us, and we're happy to follow up one on one with people. I will also mention uh, through our partnership with Illinois Soybean, 
uh, we have a number of ways that you can access Keiko ISIM, uh, including um, a hotline uh, that is uh, that that is operational and also a tax consultation uh, provided through Illinois Soybean. So definitely reach out to Illinois Soybean if you have questions about that, and and we can figure out how to get you the information you need. Um, during the presentation, as mentioned earlier, if you have questions, feel free to drop them into the Q and A or the chat function. And uh, after I give you a presentation on process and Beth talks about substance, uh, we'll then turn to Q and A. There we go. Feel free to put them in through the uh, the Q and A function. I see. So that's a good place to go. All right. So let's let's talk about where we are on Capitol Hill. Uh, and again, I'll talk about the process, and then Beth will turn to the substance. Um, I'm going to take a step back just to frame the discussion a little bit for everyone. Um, the first thing that's important to know is that Congress is very closely divided. Uh, the U.S. Senate is 50-50, half Democrat, half Republicans, uh, with uh, Vice President uh, Kamala Harris providing the tie-breaking vote. So the Democrats narrowly control the Senate. Uh, if they're going to move anything on a 50-50 basis with Kamala breaking the, or Vice President Harris breaking the tie, the, uh, the, the, the tie they can't lose a single member. So th that's how razor thin the margins are. The House is a little bit better for the Democrats, but not a lot. They can only afford to lose three uh, members of their House caucus. And if they lose too many members, then they can't pass legislation in the House either. So that's the first thing to know. The second thing to know is, that on top of that challenge for the Democrats uh, sits the filibuster. Uh, in the Senate, normal legislation uh, is subject to a point of order, uh, what's commonly called the filibuster. And what that means is if a filibuster is raised, it takes 60 votes to advance legislation. Well, the Democrats don't have 60 votes. As I just mentioned, they have 50 votes. So if an item is filibustered, it can't pass on party line votes. It has to be a bipartisan package that moves. Um, there is one exception to that though, and that's what's called the reconciliation process. And the way the budget rules are built for the House and Senate, um, the uh, uh, budget matters can move on a straight party line vote. They're not subject to a filibuster. And the way that process works, the House and the Senate pass what's called a budget resolution, a concurrent budget resolution, it doesn't go to the president. It's not signed into law. It doesn't have force and effect of law, but it is the House and Senate reaching agreement on it, what the budget should be and, and the rules with which they're going to work. Once the House and Senate have done that, if they move legislation pursuant to that budget resolution, and it's called reconciliation legislation, then they're not subject to the filibuster and they can pass legislation on a straight 50-50 vote. Um, and that's a really big deal, again, with the Democrats holding only 50 votes. It's their only opportunity to pass legislation unless they have Republican support. So their only path to passing party line support is through the reconciliation process. Um, a couple of other things to note. Reconciliation is time honored. It's been around for quite a while. In 2017, the Republicans used the reconciliation process to pass the um, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, which was the big tax cut um, uh, in 2017, that passed without a single Democratic vote. The Republicans were able to overcome the filibuster because they used the reconciliation process. So again, uh, 2017, that's how that bill moved. Again, early this year, at the start of this uh, session, right after uh, President Biden was sworn into office, uh, the Democrats used reconciliation to move a $1.9 trillion stimulus package called uh, the American Rescue Plan. And it included funding for paycheck protection. It included funding for uh, unemployment benefits and also lots of funding for vaccinations, for uh, personal protective equipment, for schools, for sort of all sorts of things relating to the pandemic. So reconciliation is a process that's used fairly often. I, I think you see it at least once a year or, or sometimes every other year, but it's, it's certainly fairly common. Um, OK, so where are we today? Um, the, the other thing that you need to understand, I think, is that uh, President Biden, when he came into office, he proposed three $2 trillion spending packages. So he proposed the American uh, Rescue Plan, which, as I mentioned, has already passed Congress and been signed into law. That was a $2 trillion package. He proposed the American uh, Jobs Plan, which is focused on hard infrastructure, so roads, bridges, 
rural broadband, those types of things. And he proposed $2 trillion in funding for that. Um, and then he proposed the American Families Plan, which was focused on what the White House referred to as soft infrastructure or the CARES economy. And those were things like uh, early childhood development, uh, uh, child care so that, uh, so that workers can, uh, can get child care and go, go to their jobs, uh, uh, community college assistance, sort of a whole package of benefits uh, aimed primarily at lower income and middle, middle class uh, voters. So the White House proposed these three packages. Uh, the first package passed, the American Rescue Plan. The second package, the uh, American Jobs Plan, took a track where Democrats and Republicans rolled up their sleeves and negotiated uh, a bipartisan bill. Uh, that's come, become known as the Bipartisan Infrastructure uh, Package, or, or BIF. Um, and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Package uh, passed the Senate with, uh, with, I think, 19 Republican votes, so very bipartisan. Um, and it spent roughly a trillion dollars. A lot of it depends on how you count. Um, but it was, again, on hard infrastructure. So things like roads, bridges, rural broadband, very, very tightly and narrowly defined. It did not have any tax increases. It was focused on reappropriating dollars that had not been spent on other stimulus packages uh, and some cost savings measures. Um, so that package passed the U.S. Senate, went over to the House. It hasn't passed the House yet. So the bipartisan infrastructure package has passed one body. It's waiting to pass the other body. Um, then the other track is the what, uh, again, Biden had introduced as the American Families Plan. Uh, that track is following the reconciliation process. So the House and Senate both passed concurrent budget resolutions authorizing $3.5 trillion in spending. Um, and that included, again, child care, early childhood development, uh, uh, community college assistance, those types of items. Um, and that package, the bu concurrent budget resolutions passed the House and Senate. Um, the House and Senate have since that time been working on uh, reconciliation bills, the bills that would implement those budget, rec uh, budget resolutions. So that's the current state of play. Um, but, uh, Speaker Pelosi had committed that she would bring the bipartisan infrastructure bill to a vote on Monday, September 27th. Um, Monday, September 27th came, Monday, September 27th passed. She did not bring the bill to a vote. And the reason she didn't is because the progressive wing of the Democratic Party said they would vote down the bipartisan infrastructure package unless the budget reconciliation bill was prepared and ready to pass as well. Depending on who you talk to, they might, maybe wanted it to pass the Senate or they at least wanted a, a global agreement among the Democrats about what would be in the package. Um, but that uh, inability of the Democrats to deliver the budget reconciliation bill has held up the bipartisan infrastructure bill. So the bipartisan infrastructure bill is sitting in the House. It's waiting to pass the House. Um, if the Democrats reach agreement on, a bi on the reconciliation bill, then presumably there are more than enough votes to pass that bipartisan infrastructure bill and we would see it roll as well. The reconciliation bill now has been has been caught in um, a dynamic where the Democrats in the House and Senate, the moderate and progressive wings of that party, have been struggling to find a compromise between themselves about what should be in that reconciliation package. Um, recall that I said the Senate is split 50-50 in order to pass legislation even on reconciliation. Every Democratic senator needs to vote for it. So they can't afford to lose a single Democratic senator. That's why Senator Joe Manchin of, of West Virginia has been in the media so, so often, and why Kristen Sinema, a Democratic uh, senator from, uh, from Arizona, has also been in the media, because the two of them, both moderate centrist Democrats, have been holding up the reconciliation package. They've said point blank, they're not going to vote for a $3.5 trillion reconciliation package. They want something less. Uh, they, they're worried about ex excessive spending. They're worried about inflation. Uh, they're worried about creating an, an, an entitlement society is one of the things uh, Senator Manchin has talked about. Um, so, so that's really put a wrench into the Democrats' ability to move the reconciliation package forward, and by extension, the ability to move the bipartisan infrastructure package forward. So negotiations are occurring between the House and Senate, moderate and Democrat or moderate and progressive uh, wings of the Democratic Party, trying to come to conclusion on the reconciliation bill. Um, 
Vice Pre or President Biden has been weighing in, trying to temp tamper uh, temper expectations about how big the bill will be, because I think he reads the writing on the wall. If Senator Manchin's only willing to have a 1.5 trillion or maybe two trillion dollar package, it doesn't do anyone any good in the Democratic Party if Biden continues to talk up a 3.5 trillion dollar package, because that's not going to be the size of the package. So President Biden has started weighing in and saying, look, everyone should level set their expectations. They believe they're going to pass a, a budget reconciliation package more in the 1.5 to 2.2 trillion dollar range. And that's the negotiation that's occurring right now is, OK, if they do that, what will be in that package? What will drop out? What programs won't get funded? Uh, will they drop early childhood assistance or child care altogether in favor of funding uh, community college assistance for working families? Will they jettison community college assistance and really focus on child care and the child uh, tax credit? Um, those are a big piece of the discussion they're having. Um, another piece of the discussion turns on the tax uh, implications. What, what are the tax provisions that are going to be uh, included in the bill that will raise the revenue uh, for this $1.5 or $2 trillion in spending? The Democrats' budget resolution said that the the bill has to be budget neutral. In fact, it said it had to reduce the deficit by at least a billion dollars. So the Democrats are not proposing to spend more money and do it on the backs of debt. They're proposing to spend more money and do it by raising taxes. That's the basic, uh, the basic trade-off. They also have provisions about uh, negotiating uh, prescription drug prices. Uh, that's a, that would raise a lot of money if the federal government got into negotiating prescription drug prices with the uh, with the pharmaceutical manufacturers. So those are sort of the two big components of, of, of funding, tax increases and drug pricing. Um, so that's another piece of the discussion. Where are we going to end up with tax increases? The House Ways and Means Committee, uh, which is the tax writing committee in the House, released a package of tax increases sufficient to, to uh, generate $3.5 trillion in funding. Not all of that was tax increases. Some of it, again, was prescription drug pricing. Some of it was what's called dynamic scoring. They say the economy is going to work better with this package and therefore will generate more revenue. But all told, their budget assumption said they would raise $3.5 trillion in, in funding. Um, so that's the first data point that we have. And Beth is going to talk through that House package, what was in the tax increases, uh, what types of tax increases the House said they wanted to, to have. Then you have a, 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 a parallel process where the Democrats in the Senate, Senate Finance Committee led by Senator Wyden of Oregon, have been working on their own tax package. They've sent pretty clear signals that a lot of what they're working on is the same as what's in the House package, but there will be some differences. So we've been tracking those differences as they surfaced so that we have a good sense, I think, at this point of what's likely to be in that final package. One final note on the negotiations between the moderates and the, uh, the progressives in the Democratic Party uh, turns on the Hyde Amendment. Uh, this has been a recent sticking point in their negotiations. As you may know, the Hyde Amendment, it goes back 20, 30 years, and says, um, says that uh, the federal government will not spend dollars on abortions, uh, except in the, inst in the case of uh, protecting the life of the mother. That's been in almost every spending bill that the uh, Congress has passed uh, for, for decades. Um, the Democrats, some Democrats, the progressive wing of the Democratic Party doesn't like that provision, and they would like to see that provision ended. They'd like funding specifically through Medicare to be able to use, be used uh, by low-income families for that purpose. Um, Senator Manchin has said it's a red line for him, that either the Hyde Amendment applies to this funding or he will not vote for this bill. So he's, he's drawn a very clear line in the sand. And that's one big sticking point. Uh, it's unclear how they'll square that circle between the progressives of the uh, Democratic Party and Senator Manchin and his support of the Hyde Amendment. But it's a very big issue to keep an eye on and certainly could take down this whole house of cards. So that's, that's another item we're watching very closely. Um, all right, let me talk for just a minute about uh, our expectations of timing and process. And then I'll turn to Beth to talk about the substance. Uh, in terms of timing, um, the Democrats have some pressure. Um, number one, uh, as you may have read in the press just in the last 24 hours, Republicans and Democrats have agreed to a short-term extension of the debt ceiling, taking us into December. 
So there's some pressure for them to get all this wrapped up by the time that debate comes back. I don't think either party wants to see the United States default on its debt. Um, so that's a, a pressure point, and that could drive this negotiation to be wrapped up by December. Um, second, and it's sort of the same time frame, you have provisions expiring uh, that the funding of the government generally, and then also the surface transportation funding, the highway bill, uh, those all expire now in December. So that's another big pressure point to try to get all of this done so that funding for the government can continue and we won't have, for example, road projects uh, suddenly not, not continuing. Um, so those are very big pressure points. The third pressure point I'd mentioned is that the Democrats want to turn their attention to voting rights. Uh, that's a high priority for them. Uh, there's a lot of talk about trying to do something on voting rights, either in a bipartisan fashion or by waiving the filibuster. It's unclear where the Democrats will go on that. They can't put it on the reconciliation package because it's not budgetary. So it's another priority they have. And I think that specifically the progressive wing of the Democratic Party is putting a lot of pressure saying, let's get the spending issues out of the way so we can turn to voting rights legislation. So those are kind of the pressures. All of that says to me that the Democrats are likely to either succeed or fail uh, during the month of October, maybe early November. That's probably our time frame. Uh, 30 days, 40 days is kind of the, the window that we're looking at. Um, I think there's a high likelihood the Democrats will pull this off. Uh, I think there's enormous pressure both on the moderates and the progressives to get a deal. Uh, sent, uh, President Biden is certainly applying that pressure, but I think the de most Democrats know they either need to deliver something or the 2022 election is gonna be a very bad election for them. They need to show that they've accomplished something. Uh, President Biden's poll numbers have been trending downward. I saw a poll earlier today that he was at 38% approval. So I think he and the rest of the Democratic Party desperately want to have uh, some success to point to. And if they are able to get a package done, it's really going to change the dynamics of, of the political discourse. For them to be able to say they delivered an infrastructure package after President Trump did not. Uh, President Trump talked about an infrastructure package a lot, but the, but the Congress never passed anything. That would be an amazing talking point for the Democrats going into 2022. Similarly, if they can deliver early childhood assistance or child care or uh, community college assistance, those types of uh, benefits for working families, I think they're gonna feel very bullish about their prospects that they have a, they have a big accomplishment to talk about. They also have funding in uh, these bills for climate change, for example. So their base, very concerned about climate change. There's a lot of money for electric vehicles and other purposes. So if they can get this package done, they have a, a good head of steam. I think that counsels that we're likely to see them get the, the package done. They could still uh, shoot themselves in the foot and not get it done. I mentioned the Hyde Amendment is one issue to watch. Um, but I would say there's probably 75% likelihood that the Democrats reach agreement and pass these bills within the next 45 days. So certain enough that we need to take this seriously and we really need to pay attention to the tax increases that are coming and we need to help farmers and ag professionals across the country really think about their businesses and, and not wait till the last moment. You don't wanna wait till December to start trying to figure out how to adjust your behavior or your business in light of what we think is coming down the pipeline for tax increases. Um, so with that, let me pause. I'm going to turn to Beth, um, who will talk through the tax, uh, tax code changes that we've seen in the House bill and that we've seen sen uh, Senator Wyden talk about in the Senate side. She may also talk about some of Biden's priorities. Um, I think the bottom line for you to think about as you're listening to Beth is that, again, there's a very high likelihood that some or many of these tax provisions will become law. Uh, not certain by any stretch, but a high likelihood. And I think our counsel to clients and ag businesses everywhere is take this seriously. Uh, start working with your tax advisor today. Don't wait until the bill passes and becomes law, because if that happens late November, you just don't have the time to make the adjustments that you need to make uh, by year's end. So time is not our friend at this point, and everyone should be preparing for these changes. So with that, Beth, why don't I pass it to you and, and you can walk through the substance. Thanks, Brian. Uh, so today we'll talk a lot about what's in the House version and uh, we'll break this up into the four main areas that we're watching. Um, we're looking at tax incentives, um, estates, gifts, and trusts, 
businesses and individuals. Um, so we'll start with the good news today, and then we'll dive into the things that, as Brian mentioned, um, are more urgent and will need more of your attention. Um, so the House version of uh, the Build Back Better plan involves the extension of a lot of different tax incentives, um, as well as creates a couple of new ones. Uh, so on the left side, you'll see a column of green energy credits. These are all existing credits um, that are extended at least to 2031, so an additional 10 years or more. Um, these involve things like credits for um, the personal personal use renewable ener energy property. Think um, solar panels for your house. Um, it also includes a credit for um, certain types of improvements to commercial buildings, like energy efficient lighting and HVAC systems. Um, a credit for uh, contractors who build energy efficient new homes. Um, as well as some biodiesel and renewable diesel credits. Um, we'll spend just a couple minutes here real quick on the production tax credit and the investment tax credit for renewable electricity. Um, these are credits for uh, producing electricity from renewable sources like solar or wind, um, or uh, in the alternative, you can either get a credit for producing the electricity or a credit for constructing the, the assets that allow you to generate the renewable electricity. So the investment tax credit is a credit for the cost of your investment in uh, renewable electricity facilities like wind turbines, solar panels, and the like. Um, the proposal that the House has put forth um, in includes increasing the amount of credit available under both of those credits, as well as increases the time frame for people to begin construction um, and begin generating electricity uh, using those renewable facilities. Additionally, on the right, there are sort of those non-green energy related credits that are either created um, or expanded and extended. Um, under the, the disaster and resiliency programs, this really involves um, exclusion from income uh, for payments that individuals receive from states uh, to recover from natural disasters. Um, there are also credits for investments in affordable housing in lower income communities, um, as well as incentives for um, rehabilitating old and historic buildings and invest credits for investing in lower income communities. So, um, you know, investing in businesses in those areas, the new markets tax credit. Um, the government's investment in the new markets tax credit would be expanded, as well as expand the availability of the credit, which is administered through state agencies. And finally, there is uh, the pathway to practice, which involves some tax incentives for individuals who grew up in rural communities uh, to go to medical school and then return to rural areas to practice medicine. Um, so these are the main uh, tax incentives that are included in the House package. You know, in terms of the news and, and what we're hearing, we haven't heard any real objection to any of these credits. Really, the, the main um, the main controversy here is going to be on the tax increases, as Brian had mentioned. Um, but the, the House Ways and Means Committee does have some significant tax outlays in terms of these tax credits that sort of reduce the amount overall of the, of the tax increases and the increased revenue that, that the government will generate to pay for these other uh, proposals. So let's talk about the estate and trust provisions. These are some changes that will require your attention before Congress acts rather than after the president signs the bill. Um, the, the first item is the reduction of the estate and gift tax exemption. Under the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, uh, the estate tax exemption increased from $5 million per person adjusted for inflation to $10 million per person adjusted. Um, in 2021, the estate and gift tax exemption is about $11.8 million. 
the House Ways and Means Committee would reduce that exemption to $5 million per person adjusted for inflation beginning on January 1st of 2022. Um, so what this means is that essentially the amount of gifts that you can make during your lifetime um, and the amount of assets that you can own at your death it, without being subject to transfer taxes is cut in half. Um, taking into account about average inflation, we would estimate that on January 1, 2022, your uh, the per person estate and gift tax exemption would be about $6 million per person. Um, when we think about the effect that this would have on, um, on Illinois producers, um, according to an, a University of Illinois Department of Agricultural and Consumer Economics study, um, estate taxes currently impact about three-tenths of 1% of Illinois farmers. Um, and when that department evaluated um, the For the 99.5% Act, um, which proposed a $3.5 million estate tax exemption, they determined that about 5% of Illinois farmers would owe estate tax. So this provision, or this proposal, of course, involves a, a bit higher of an exemption, but we're really going from a very small percentage of Illinois farmers who would be impacted by the estate tax to around 5%, maybe a bit less because of that difference in the exemption amount. Um, for context nationwide, um, in 2019, when the exemption amount was about $11.5 million per person, about 6,400 estate tax returns were filed, and only about 2,600 of those owed any tax. Um, in contrast, in 2016, when the exemption was five and a half million dollars, there were 13,500 estate tax returns filed and about 5,500 estates actually owed estate tax. So a reduction in the estate tax exemption will have a significant impact. Um, and while you have a significant amount of estate and gift tax exemption, you know, if you have a significant amount of assets, definitely be talking to your uh, tax and um, estate planning advisors and make plans to make gifts before the end of the year. If, you know, if gifting was in your five-year plan, we would recommend that you, that you accelerate that somewhat significantly. Um, additionally, these next three bullet points involve some more complex um, estate planning techniques. Uh, under the current tax code, there is a provision that allows for certain types of trusts to be treated for income tax purposes as not separate from their owner. So the owner recognizes um, income tax on the assets of the trust, but that trust is not included in their taxable estate. So it's a these trusts are a way to um, take assets and move them out of your estate while still maintaining some level of control over those assets. Um, the president has been um, pretty consistent in his objection to different types of estate planning techniques that allow for essentially sheltering assets rather than truly irrevocably giving those assets away. Um, and so these, the House Ways and Means Committee's proposal would involve including those types of trusts in the individual's taxable estate. So essentially the only way that you would be able to get assets completely out of your estate would be to either make gifts outright or to transfer assets in irrevocable trusts that are not treated as grantor trusts. Um, this provision would apply to trusts that are executed and transfers that are made to existing trusts. Um, that happen on or rather after the date of enactment. So the date that the president signs this budget reconciliation package. So this is a major reason why if you already have some estate plan in place, um, or if you've been talking about getting an estate plan set up, um, and your advisors have recommended using these types of trusts, we would recommend that you do everything that you can to get those trusts in place within the next, as Brian said, you know, 45 days, um, and, and if at all possible sooner, um, this tool would be completely unavailable if you don't have it set up and actually funded um, within, you know, the time that it takes for the Democrats to come to some sort of an agreement on the spending package. 
Additionally, the House Ways and Means Committee would prohibit valuation discounts on passive assets um, that are owned by entities that are contributed to trusts. So really what this means is if you have a business entity that has investment assets um, or any sort of other passive income assets, um, you cannot take a valuation discount to reduce the amount of value that you're recognizing gift tax on. You instead would have to take just the proportionate share of the value of those passive assets. Um, where we're concerned with this provision is um, it is unclear from the legislative language whether um, farm real estate for an individual who is actively engaged in farming, whether that real estate, if it's leased to third parties, is still considered an active asset or whether it would be a passive asset. So we would strongly recommend if you are considering um, gifting or transferring you know, operating entities and especially um, land holding entities into trust that you um, that you do that and talk to your advisors about accelerating the time frame on, on those types of gifts. Uh, the third, uh, excuse me, the fourth bullet point uh, is about recognizing for income tax purposes, um, sales between a grantor and a trust that is, again, that type of irrevocable trust that's treated as or had previously been treated as disregarded um, as separate from their owner. Um, so what this means is that for sales that happen after the, the enactment of the reconciliation package, instead of being able to treat a sale to a trust as, as being a sale to yourself um, and therefore having no tax effect, um, you would instead have to personally recognize capital gain income on the sale of that asset as well as interest income. Um, without having the benefit uh, that you previously had of that trust being excluded from your taxable estate. So again, a sale of, of assets and of business entities is a pretty commonly used estate planning technique. So if you have plans to um, sell or transfer any of your assets, you know, that, that is in the next few months or in the next few years, definitely recommend that you talk as soon as you can to your advisors about how to accelerate that time frame. Finally, and this is where we have at least maybe a little bit of good news, uh, the House Ways and Means proposal increases the availability and the amount of the available special use valuation reduction um, to $11.7 million for deaths that occur after December 31st, 2021. Um, the special use valuation allows for an estate to reduce the fair market value of farm real estate from its fair market value to a special use value that is significantly lower than what the property may have appraised for. And what this means is that you're, you can shrink the size of the estate that's subject to tax Although under current law, you can only reduce it by $750,000 adjusted for inflation. With land prices increasing the way they are, that, that valuation reduction really doesn't do a whole lot, especially for estates of, of you know, larger size. However, uh, and it looks like what Congress is doing here is attempting to um, trade off and provide some sort of agricultural exemption to this reduction in the estate tax exemption. Um, the, being able to reduce the value of your uh, farm real estate by up to tw nearly $12 million uh, could result in going from having a taxable estate to not having a taxable estate at all. Um, that said, this provision is not without complication you have to transfer these assets uh, to a qualified family member, and that family member has to be actively engaged in farming. In addition, before your death, you had to have been actively engaged in farming, or a family member had to be actively engaged in farming that per using that particular asset. For context, you know, we talked about in 2016, 13,500 estate tax returns were filed. Um, only about 1,900 estates actually claimed the special use valuation on the estate tax return. So just over 10% of the estate tax returns that were filed in 2016. So 
there are significant complexities that arise around this. So this is certainly not something that you can just take for granted. Some planning does need to be done to make sure that not only do you qualify for the special use valuation, but also the, the individuals that will be receiving that property also qualify. So there are some significant changes um, and these all absolutely would in require that you talk to you know, your estate planning attorney, your tax advisors to be able to react and to be proactive about the types of decisions that you're making for estate planning purposes you know, within the next 30 to 45 days rather than waiting to see what really shakes out in Congress. Um, because the estate tax exemption is at an historically high amount, the worst case scenario at this point is that you have conversations with your advisors and you make transfers that you otherwise would have made, but maybe would have waited a little bit longer to make. So really there's, there's no loss in having these conversations now, even if these proposals don't make it into the final version of the law. So let's move on to some of the business tax proposals. When uh, President Biden was campaigning, he had proposed increasing the corporate tax rate to 28%. Um, Senator Manchin had indicated and has continued to indicate that he wouldn't support a corporate tax rate any higher than 25%. Sort of splitting the those preferences down the middle, the Ways and Means Committee has returned to a bracket system and has increased the top rate of corporate tax for corporations that have taxable income over $5 million to 26.5%. Um, for corporations that are showing taxable income of $400,000 or less, um, you're actually going to have about a 3% tax cut. The lowest tax bracket under this proposal would be 18%. And if you're between 4 million and 5 million, uh, you still will have a bit of a tax decrease um, because you have the first 400,000 of income subject to tax at 18% instead of 21%. Um, but still, if you've got a corporation that is recognizing income of $5 million or less, uh, you will have a, you know, at worst no change in your tax liability. Um, additionally, this proposal would eliminate the benefit of income tax brackets for corporations that have taxable income over $10 million um, and also assesses a flat 26.5% uh, tax on personal service corporations, which are corporations that are owned by service providers uh, that recognize the income from the services provided. Um, a good example would be um, groups of doctors at hospitals who um, practice together. They those types of entities are personal service corporations. So the average person, especially the average um, producer, not going to be impacted by that particular proposal. Additionally, there are some changes to the interest expense deduction. So instead of limiting the interest expense deduction um, at the S corporation um, shareholder or, or rather at Rather than limiting the interest expense deduction at the entity level, the limitation is only applied at the individual owner's level. And what this means is that it's possible that um, you may be eligible for a larger interest expense deduction if, if you have a highly leveraged business and your interest expense is currently being limited. Um, the interest expense deduction limitation is a proposal, or rather is a provision that was um, included in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, so it really hasn't been around for very long. Additionally, the proposal makes some significant modifications to the international tax system, and the goal of these changes is to really disincentivize uh, corporations and businesses from offshoring jobs and provides better incentives for individuals, or rather for businesses, that want to bring their jobs back into the U.S., the last area of the business tax provisions that is important to take note of is that the qualified business income deduction um, 
which is a 20% deduction for certain income that comes from pass-through entities like partnerships and S-corporations, uh, would be limited to $500,000 for married couples filing joint returns. Uh, under the current law, while there are some phase-outs for higher income individuals, there is no actual limitation on the amount of deduction that can be taken. Um, since this is a 20% deduction, essentially, after if you are recognizing more than two and a half million dollars of pass-through income, you are losing the benefit of, of that QBI deduction uh, for you know the for any income that you have over two and a half million dollars. This would apply to tax years beginning after December 31st, 2021, as do all of the other business proposals that, that we just discussed. Finally, we've got some individual income tax provisions uh, to talk about. Again, the president had been pretty specific about wanting to increase the top individual income tax rate back to pre-Trump uh, administration levels. So the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act made the top tax bracket for individuals 37%. So this would be about a 3% increase for individuals at the, at the top of the income tax brackets. Additionally, this proposal would shrink the level at which the, the top tax rate kicks in. So rather than um, kicking in at about $509,000 of taxable income, it's going to start at $450,000. Additionally, the administration had proposed um, increasing the top capital gains rate to 39.6% for individuals with uh, with capital gains over a million dollars. Instead, what the House Ways and Means Committee has proposed is a top ta capital gains tax rate of 25%. Under current law, the top rate is 20%. So if you are um, if you are earning more than, and your taxable income is more than 450,000, instead of paying a, a top capital gains rate of 20%, you'd be paying 25%. Another area to take note of that is an important change is that it applies the net investment income tax to active income for individuals with taxable income in excess of $400,000, $500,000 if you're married. And what this means is under current law, the net investment income tax only applies to passive income over $250,000. So if all of your income is active business income, you aren't paying that investment income tax. Uh, what the Ways and Means Committee has proposed is assessing that additional 3.8% tax for any business income if your taxable income is in excess of $400,000. So that's a 3.8% additional tax increase uh, if you are earning what the Democrats would call, you know, a significant amount of money. And that applies even if it's, you know, a one-time increase because you've sold a business or, you know, moved assets or, or anything like that. So um, a potential tax increase coming your way and maybe an unexpected way. Additionally, um, the Ways and Means Committee's proposal uh, permanently expands the child tax credit from the original, the original child tax credit was increased to $2,000 per child um, with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, and in 2020 increased to $3,000 uh, per child and $3,600 for children under the age of six. Um, that was only applicable for 2020 and 2021, um, so this would make that increase in the child tax credit permanent as well as for the next four years, um, have a monthly child tax credit payment directly to individuals uh, rather than individuals only being able to claim the child tax credit on their tax return at the end of the year. Finally, the House Ways and Means Committee's proposal modifies the rules relating to retirement plan accounts with balances over $10 million. Um, if you're an individual that earns more than $400,000. Uh, so if you have a 401k account or an IRA that has a balance of 
$12 million that these new rules would require that you take an immediate distribution of $2 million to get your account balance back to $10 million or less. For the vast majority of Americans, that won't impact your retirement plan or the way that you take your retirement plan distributions, but it is an interesting change to the rules relating to those accounts. Those are all of the provisions that we're watching closely on um, the House Ways and Means Committee's proposal. Brian, when we think about the likelihood that some of these or all of these provisions will make it into the final bill. Do you have a sense of what may be cut first or, or what is more likely not to make it into the final bill? Uh, yeah, I think there's some good rules of thumb. I mean, number one, remember, originally the House Ways and Means talked about $3.5 in spending. We've now knocked those numbers down to $1.5 to 2. So there's a lot of uh, increases uh, in revenue that are not going to be needed to offset the spending. However, a big chunk of that's probably prescription drug uh, uh, pricing. Uh, Senator Cinema Sin said she doesn't want to go down that path. So that puts more pressure on these tax, tax pieces. Um, as a general rule of thumb, the more controversial provisions probably won't be in the final package. Uh, we're cautiously optimistic that the step up in basis uh, is dead. Uh, we're, that's one we're tracking very closely and, and lobbying on, uh, but, uh, but it could sneak back in. So that, that is one we're watching. I'm looking at the time. I see we've got 13 minutes till the top of the hour. Should we, should we go to some questions if we have some in the, in the Q&A and uh, in the chat? Uh, what what a what a great uh, segue! First question: you, do, Would you like to to lead it, or should I uh, do the questions? I'm happy to lead it for you, Brian. Right. The, you first, go ahead. the first question we have is: This issue may may be raised yet in the webinar, but what about the transfer tax and the stepped up basis? See that that's almost like a like someone just fed the question to us just as we were getting to that topic. Um, so Beth can talk about the substance of step up, but again, I I. We're, we're cautiously optimistic that that one will drop out. There is pressure among the Democrats to kind of soak it to the rich. I think that you'll see a lot of that kind of rhetoric that uh, they want to make sure the tax code is adjusted so that the rich aren't con continuing to get richer. And so that could put some pressure on keeping step up in. But it's been controversial enough, and there are enough moderate Democrats that say they don't want it. Cindy Axney of Iowa, for example, or there's a whole slew of, of Democrats from farm areas who have said they don't want to see this come in. So I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic it will stay out. Beth, uh, well, do you want to give any color commentary on that? Sure. So when the uh, Department of Treasury issued the Green Book, which is their summary of the budget proposals that they expected um, the president to make, although it is ultimately up to Congress to enact legislation following the president's budget priorities, um, that the president's proposal involved changes to the way that capital gains are recognized or not recognized. Um, so going from not recognizing capital gain on gift or uh, upon an individual's death to recognizing uh, capital gains as if those assets were sold when they were transferred by gift or uh, at death. That proposal met a lot of uh, backlash, especially from um, agricultural organizations, and it luckily did not make it into the House Ways and Means committee's version of, of the budget package. That said, we have continued to see articles and, and op-eds from individuals within the Biden administration supporting the inclusion of some sort of change to capital gains tax or step up in basis. So there is a possibility that Senator Wyden does include some sort of change to step up in basis in the Finance Committee's markup of the bill. That said, um, it's been pretty clear that especially the more moderate senators are not willing to entertain that idea. And there are certainly more moderate House members that would not support um, that sort of provision. So um, as Brian said, I think we're caught cautiously optimistic that, that the change to step up and basis that we were expecting to see is for now and for this budget package not going to be included. 
All right, thank you. Just one more reminder to the audience that if you have any questions for Brian and Beth, please go ahead and submit those either through the Q&A function or the chat function at the bottom of your Zoom window. Our next question, have you applied the income tax provisions to average net farm incomes to estimate an impact? Beth, I'm letting you take that one. All right, so we haven't yet done any sort of quantitative analysis on these provisions as a whole to average or model farms to, to determine any sort of impact. You know, there are some of these provisions that we talked about that we do see individuals taking advantage of fairly regularly. So from a qualitative perspective, we can say with confidence that a lot of these proposals would have a negative impact on average people. But in terms of assigning a dollar amount to that impact, we haven't, haven't done that yet. I will say the one place we did do modeling on behalf of national corn growers, we did an analysis specifically on the step up in basis and how that would affect farmers. Um, and that, that analysis is available if anyone would like to see that. Um, um, but, but that's the one place where we've done modeling this year. Okay, I'm gonna give it one last call for questions. Um, and in the meantime, I'd like to thank both Beth and Brian for their informative presentation today and helping us prepare for tax changes likely to become law. Um, and with that- I do, see, I do see a comment. What about annual wealth tax? Yes. Beth? So there have been increasingly, um, especially with the more progressive senators, um, proposals that were either introduced or talked about that would assess an annual wealth tax that is not included in the House Ways and Means Committee's version. And, you know, Brian could probably speak better to the political chances than I can, but I don't see, even if something like that is ever introduced, that it really goes anywhere. Brian, would you agree? Yes, but with the caveat again, the Democrats really seem to be on this soak it to the rich, uh, platform. So, you know, a, an annual wealth tax resonates to the progressive wing. So there could be pressure to put it in, but I think it's less likely. And now I see another Q&A. Do you want to see that one up? Sure. Okay. So the question says, if a farmer paid $1,000 an acre for land and the value at death is $10,000 an acre, which is left to his children, what is the value of the land for tax planning purposes when the land is passed on to the following generation? So when we're thinking about um, planning for transfers, um, you should assume that the current fair market value is what is going to be either included in your taxable estate or um, is going to be subject to gift tax. So when you're planning for those sorts of transfers, use the current fair market value um, as your guide for determining the amount of assets that need to be moved to avoid um, or minimize federal estate tax. Now, Beth, is that is that assuming step up in basis is repealed, or how does step up in basis fit into this question? Right. So that assumes that that assumes that step up in basis is still intact. So really, all that does is uh, it affects what the next generation's investment in that asset is is deemed to be. So under step up and basis, the, the following generation, if that if that land is passed at death, their basis would be $10,000 per acre rather than the $1,000 per acre that you paid for it. Um, if step up and basis were repealed, um, the following generation's investment in that asset would be considered $1,000 per acre, what you paid for it. Um, and so really the effect of any sort of repeal of step up and basis would be to increase the amount of capital gains that subsequent generations would recognize um, on the sale of inherited assets. And really, just to emphasize, changes to step up and basis have not been proposed or not under any sort of pending legislation. So while we are still watching and will be uh, responding to any sort of legislation that does include it, it is not currently on the table. Okay, and I don't see any more questions at this time. Um, if you do have follow-up questions for Brian and Beth, you can send 
ISA an email at ilsoy at ilsoy.org. And we can get you connected with them to answer any more questions. Um, but again, thank you, Beth and Brian, for your presentation today. Um, and thank you all for attending. We hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Be well.